morning? Well, youth Sunday. I was a youth pastor many, many years ago. And uh, so I always like to see the youth up here. I can't decide what my favorite moment was today. I'm kind of vacillating between uh, the ushers move down the aisle. That was good. And uh, Do Lord took me way back to Sunday school days. Way back in the day, it was my favorite song. So brother, thank you for sharing that. Good memory there. And, but I, I'm gonna probably have to go with Okay, there you go. <laughs> I got that one. Well, I uh, want to share with you this morning that uh, we were able to get all of our women who were at Hope Gardens and the kids and our seniors uh, who had to evacuate last Friday. They came down out of Hope Gardens uh, because of the fires, had to put them in the gym downtown. And we were able to, Betty texted me, they, uh, they're off and they're back to Hope Gardens. So we're happy to hear that. So those of you who are aware of that and been praying, thank you for that. So we're excited about that. Today I want to talk to you, though, about uh, the subject, the challenge of change. The challenge of change. I know your church uh, uh, is going to be going through a change and a challenge this coming year, as Pastor Ed revealed to you last week. And I want to talk to you from God's word to give you some encouragement about this uh, concept of change. Most of us are not real fans of change. It is a challenge for us. Transition is difficult. Uh, I think uh, someone once said, the only constant in life is that things are always changing. And just when you kind of figure life out, it changes on you again. As a matter of fact, God even made the human body that it is constantly in change. We are decaying constantly. We're kind of like Ford Escorts. We're just falling apart. And so it's constantly different. And so God, uh, in his word, shows us a lot of ex uh, situations. I understand last week uh, you looked at Joshua and how that the nation of Israel had to go through a change in leadership from Moses to Joshua and the courage that that requires of both Joshua and the people. Today I want to draw our attention to the book of Genesis chapter 11. If you wouldn't mind standing with me, I'd like to read for you Genesis 11, and we're going to start in verse 27. Genesis 11, verse 27 is where we'll start. Genesis 11, 27. And it says this, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, who will later be called Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. That's actually in, in Babylonia. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren and she had no children. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Father, we ask your blessing on your word. May it challenge, encourage us in this time of change. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're talking about the challenge of change. You see, change is not something that comes easily for many of us because we like to get into our comfort zones. I want to share from this passage and the chapter 12, the first three verses, three principles that we learn about life and this idea of change and why it is so challenging. And the first one is this. I want you to notice that the, 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 the key character is Abram. And he came with his father. They lived in the south of Babylonia. Babylonia was uh, a very idolatrous, evil 
nation. And so God called his father and he took his family out. And if you saw it on a map, they, they traveled quite a distance and they went all the way through the country, out of the country, all the way to the top. Now, in the passage, do you notice where they were headed? They were supposed to be going to the land of Canaan, which is, as you're going to see in chapter 12, the promised land. Uh, but you know, his father never made it. On the way, they got right to the tip of it and they stopped. It says that, that his, one of his sons died. You know, it's got to be a very difficult thing to bury a son. It's just not supposed to work that way. Sons bury fathers, not the other way around. And, and this kind of shook things up, and, and I don't know if that's why, or if it had something to do with it, but uh, sometimes the loss of close people in our lives uh, causes us to make an adjustment. And instead of going to Canaan, the Bible says, and uses a word, that they settled just north of there. I think settle speaks of settlement. It speaks of uh, setting up uh, their, their living environment. But I think it also symbolically says something else. That sometimes when God calls us to a place that he wants us to go and bless us, sometimes we stop a little bit shy and we settle for something less. And I want to encourage the church today to be thinking about that because it starts with settling but you're gonna see where this passage is going to take us so here's the first thing I want us to notice we have a tendency to develop comfort zones have you noticed that we like to live in comfort as a matter of fact it's, it's one of the highest values of our Western world we work really hard at trying to be comfortable Everybody likes to be comfortable. Who, who wouldn't want that? This is kind of a human tendency, and certainly in our society, we have a tendency to, to develop comfort zones as well. You see, they settled into their environment and with their relations around them. Uh, they, they wanted a place to belong and a place to have belongings. And sometimes these things cause us to settle for something short of what God wants. You see, I think there's two dangers, Pastor Ed, in settling. Settling in your comfort zone. The first one is this. It can generate idols that challenge the lordship of Christ. It can develop idols. Pretty soon our things or the people around us can become our idols and challenge the lordship of Christ. And he is no longer first and foremost in our life. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is this. You know, I work with people who have, a lot of them have addictions that they're trying to overcome and recover from. But I think the church can sometimes fall into an addiction. The addiction of mediocrity. Settling for something less than everything that God wants for us. And comfort zones have a way of getting us stuck. Stuck in our old ways, stuck in the same things, and no longer with the desire, the urgency to maybe reach the lost, no longer a desire to keep moving forward in our walk with the Lord. Sometimes we think, this is good enough. And we land just north of the promised land. We have a tendency to develop comfort zones. That's the first thing we learn from the passage. It's part of the human experience, and we have to fight against it. And you know, God will help us with that because the next thing we're going to see, look at verse 32. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. The very next verse, chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now, what's, what's the now? Now is referring, his father died. And again, it's a death that moves the radar screen. And the Lord spoke. In his father's death, the Lord spoke to the son. And he said, Abram, I have something I want to tell you. What's the first word in your Bible that he told Abram? Go. Leave. Leave what? Your comfort zone. He said, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
the land that he originally wanted Terah to go to, but they settled. You know, God doesn't speak a lot. He spoke to Adam, then he spoke to Noah, and now he's speaking to Abram. And when the Lord speaks, we should listen. And you know what? Here's the second point. Now, we have a tendency to develop comfort zones, don't we? But God has a tendency to disrupt comfort zones. God has a tendency to disrupt our comfort zones. Have you noticed this in life, how God rolls? He generally doesn't work in the comfort zone. He generally will disrupt it because he's concerned that we don't settle. You know, going, Abram, I want you to leave, look what it says. I want you to leave your country, your kindred, and your father's house. Do you, do you see the yours? Those, yours is the comfort zone. The people you're familiar with, I want you to leave them behind. The land you're familiar with, leave it behind. The houses, leave them behind. The tents, leave them behind. And I'm going to send you somewhere that I'm not even going to tell you. When you get there, I'll let you know. Now, my question is, do you think that would be just a tad unsettling? Exactly what God does. He unsettles the settled. There's a reason for it. And we'll see that in just a moment. You know, some people will say, hey, we'd like to uh, take up you on your offer to come visit Skid Row. I'll go to churches and invite him to come see Jesus who lives down on Skid Row. You know, he's thirsty, he's hungry, he's just got out of prison. And when you come and visit him, um, when, you, when you come and do this for the least of these, you've done it for me, he said. So Jesus is actually in the eyes of the people who are living in those tents or on the street uh, sleeping on a piece of cardboard or in the rescue mission uh, with eyes that seem blank because it they, they feels like there's just no hope left. That's where he resides. And so I encouraged people in churches to come visit him. But uh, sometimes people will say, well, Pastor Dan, is it safe? You know, I've heard a lot of things about Skid Row. As a matter of fact, just a week ago, someone died right on our corner. Somebody was shot and killed. Uh, that's not unusual. That's not the first time it's happened since I've been there. Is it safe? Um, is it really what they're saying is, is it comfortable? And uh, I try to be nice about it <laughs> and not sarcastic. Um, but here's my question. Why is that the first question you ask after I invite you? Why is that such an important issue? I don't see any Bible verses that talk about how God is concerned about our comfort. I see how he disrupts it. I see how he says, you know what? When you live by faith, it is risky. You don't know. It is uncertain. You can't foresee what's coming your way. Do you see that? God has a tendency to disrupt comfort zones. Is God safe? Was the cross safe? Was that comfortable? It was comfortable in heaven where the angels even worship you where we are with your father, where everything is, is beautiful, as the song says. But to leave his comfort zone, to come here to a cradle and then a cross, that's not safe and it's not comfortable. But it is the way of God to disrupt our comfort zones so that we do not have idols where we place our security and find our significance in things that are only settled. God says, I want to unsettle that. God has a tendency to disrupt comfort zones. I want you to notice something, uh, and I, if you have a, a pen in your hand, you might want to mark up your Bible here. You ready? A couple little words I want you to underline or circle. You ready? Verse one, now the Lord said to Abraham, go, and what does it say next? In my Bible, it says, from, circle the word from. This is an important word. Now the Lord said, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house. So from your house, from your family, from the land, your country, everything you're familiar with. 
And then it says this, to, and circle the word to, to the land that I will show you. Now take, a, you see how you circled from and you circled to? Now draw a line to connect those two and you will understand what God's doing. You see, transition and change is both from something and to something. From is something called your comfort zone, what you're used to, what you're familiar with, what provides you security, what makes you feel significant. The people you know and that are your friends. The, the environment that you know how to roll in. But he wants you to go from your comfort zone to something that is unsettling. That is the journey of faith. Faith is risky. Faith creates uncertainty. Faith stirs up a need to depend upon God. And that's why he does it lest we have idols or become addicted to mediocrity and lose sight of his kingdom, more concerned about the American dream than the kingdom of God. This is Pastor Ed's journey. This was Christ's journey. This is Abram's journey. This is the church's journey. And this is our challenge to change. But it is God who initiates the change. Do you see that? This wasn't Abram's idea. It wasn't his father's idea. It was God. God is at work in Compton. Amen? He is at work in the Hope of Christ Church. Amen? On the corner of Rosemead and Harris. Amen? And God wants to take it to new places. And sometimes that will require new leadership, new ministry, new ways of doing things, and moves us from our comfort zone into a very unsettled feeling, which will require us to live and walk by faith, not by sight. Sight is comfort zone. We have a tendency to develop comfort zones, and God has a tendency to disrupt them. Now, my question is why? And that's the third thought. I want you to notice, and again, if you have a pen in your hand, pencil, you might want to underline some words or phrases. Are you ready? Let's read it again. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house, to the land that what? What's your Bible say? That I will. I want you to underline those two words, that phrase, I will show you. Verse 2, and what's it say? I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. Do you see, five times in three verses, there's a phrase, I will. That is the will and the disposition and the promise of of God for those who walk by faith. Your pastor is a man of faith. He doesn't necessarily know the next chapter of his life, nor do we, but we should not presume it should always be the same to be good. Is it possible that sometimes through time we get stuck and settle? The promises of God are there to help us with our faith and our trust. 
to help us overcome any kind of an addiction we might get to mediocrity or those idols that replace God in our life. You know, I uh, was talking to Ed a while back and I was sharing with him my journey of faith. Uh, Abram had his, Ed's going through his, I had mine. I, I was pretty comfortable down in South Orange County. As a matter of fact, I remember praying things like this, God, I am really comfortable, thank you so much, and I'm not asking you to do anything about it. I just want you to know I'm thankful just in case, you know, you know there's any temptation to change that. But after a while, I started coming up to the mission and volunteering, and I saw all these miraculous things God was doing. And pretty soon, I saw how they were living. I saw how other people live in the city, especially Skid Row. And, and you know, where I'm at, it's rich man ministry. I never, I, when I proposed to my wife, Betty, back in Bible college days, I said, you know, look, I am never going to have any money. I'm going to go into ministry. I'm going to be poor. But if you want to do the Lord's work with me, I need a partner. And, and I hope it's you. I had no idea pastors can make the kind of money I was making, Ed. <laughs> that church was generous. But you know what happened? I, I use this phrase. I began to become uncomfortable being comfortable. Because I started thinking, you know, when I read my Bible, I don't see anybody changing the world in a comfort zone. Then I started thinking, maybe I'm not living by faith. Maybe I've become addicted to mediocrity. I'm going, where are the stories of change in the church? Where are the stories of radical transformation, of how God is working? I can see them down on Skid Row. When it's really dark, the light shines bright. But I couldn't see him in the suburbs, at the beach, where we we're all very comfortable. And I began to think, you know, I'm, I'm getting up in age, and I got one good run in me. And so I got away and I said, God, <clears throat> look, I'm not asking you to do anything different in my life. But I have a sneaky suspicion you want me to do something different. And so I said, God, in the, I got 10 years left in, in my mind. I was get, coming up on 60. And I said, uh, God, I, what could I do in the next 10 years that would make the greatest difference 10,000 years from now? And I said, God, whatever that is, would you give me the courage and the faith to step into it? And guess where he led me? The Union Rescue Mission on Skid Row. And I said, <laughs> they can't afford me. <laughs> I literally told God that. You know, I'd become accustomed to being settled. I had developed a comfort zone. And God, you are disrupting it with thoughts about that. And I thought, you know, it took me about six months to work through my materialism. I did, here I am, the pastor of the church, and I, and I you know, y'all, you never think you're, 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 you've been infected. You always think you're beyond that until you're tested. And now I'm being tested, and I realize, okay, I'll own it. I have a problem. I'm not trusting God. I, I'm trusting my paycheck. I, I got I to gotta prepare for my future. I need to have a retirement plan. I need, I, I need to, you know, and God said, I will tell you where we're going and when we get there. So I finally got to the place where I realized, you know what? I'm telling God something different than I tell anybody who'd walk into my office for counseling. So I said, that can't be right. So we straightened that out, but I thought, God, you must have the wrong guy. I, I live 60 miles south, 70 miles south in a suburb at the beach, coming down to Skid Row where, where people struggle with mental illness and addictions and poverty. You know, God, I'm, I'm the rich man pastor, what, not the poor man pastor. What do I know? And he said, exactly, I use the least likely people. And then it was that, okay, after working through that, God wasn't done. And then he said, oh, one other thing. You need an education. And you need to develop trust fast. How do you do that? Trust can't be 
Uh, you can't bypass trust for influence. People have to know you love them and you're behind them and you support them and you identify with them if they're going to trust you. And then when they trust you, you can impact. Then you can guide them to God. So I said the best way to do that is spend more time with them. That's the best way to do that. So I told the CEO, if you let me move into the mission with the men, I'll do it. But I thought, you know what, certainly my wife won't let that happen, so that she's my scapegoat, right? So I, she said, no, that's fine. <laughs> and so, so now I'm, I, I'm, I tell my, you know, I'm living with the men on the mission in the fifth floor in my office on a pull-out sofa for four years. I've been sleeping four nights a week in a pull-out bed on my office on the fifth floor at the Union Rescue Mission. I tell my friends I'm, going to, I'm moving to L.A., uh, getting a penthouse. <laughs> Uh, but I don't really see it as a sacrifice I see it as what God's called me to do he said I will show you I will train you I will teach you I will take care of you and I, I don't I, I haven't been happier this is the most effective ministry I feel like I've done in my whole life feel like I'm making an impact. I feel like I'm learning. I feel like I'm growing. I feel more dependent upon God. Every, every day I wake up going, I can't do this. I need help. That's a walk of faith. Pastor Ed is walking into a situation like that, as is the congregation. And here's the third thing I want to tell you and close with this. You see, we all have a tendency to develop comfort zones. But there's a danger there. You can't stay there too long. You're not gonna get to the next level of what God wants. You can't stop just short of the promised land, just north of it, just because you came a long way from Babylon. So here's the deal. God has a tendency to disrupt our comfort zones because he has a tendency to, to display greatness outside of those comfort zones. You eat, God wants to go from settled to great. Look what it says. He says, and I'll make of you a, what kind of a nation? A great nation. A great church. A great people. A great city. A great neighborhood. A great people yes. and I will bless you and make your name great yes. he said Abram I'm going to do something great Pastor Ed I want to do something great I want to make your name great I, you know what I was at that church for 20 some, 22 years and it wasn't until I left that they said you inspire me <laughs> they said you inspire me because you left Amen. well what did I do while I was there Pastor Ed you see, it motivated them. I had no idea that was going to motivate them to move forward in their walk with God. But when they saw their leaders step out in faith, out of the comfort zone, it challenged them to change as well, Pastor Ed. I'll bless those who bless you. Church, if you bless your pastor, God will bless you. If you support him, if you let him know you're sad, but you believe in what he's doing. And you know what? I believe the church is headed for something great. And you know, he's not walking out on you. He's moving from his comfort zone to the next thing God has. He has some ideas, but he doesn't know quite what it is. When I, when I, when I moved, I wasn't really sure what I was getting into. I was pretty sure I'd be overwhelmed, and I was. But that causes you to walk by faith. And that honors God, and he blesses it. He wants to bless the church. You know, Pastor Ed, um, he knows something. He knows you're not going to move him out. He knows you're not going to ask him to leave. He could stay here as long as he wants. And you know what? In many churches, pastors do that. Past their level of effectiveness into their comfort zone and comfort years. And Pastor Ed says, I care too much for the kingdom of God and the greatness of the church Amen.
to let that happen. So I will prepare them as I prepare myself. That we don't settle for what we already have or mediocrity or status quo. Ed took this church to a new level ten, nine years ago. And as he leaves on his 10th year, we fully anticipate God taking us to the next level. Amen? Amen. We have a tendency to develop comfort zones. And you have one here. You're comfortable with your pastor, with your services, with the ministries that are offered. We've gotten into the to that system. But we can't stay there. Sometimes we have to disrupt how we do things and who leads them. And that is not the church's call. It is not Pastor Ed's decision how long he stays here. You know that? Your pastor understands he doesn't run the church. He's not the head of Hope in Christ Church. Who is? God. And he is the only one who has the right to call his leaders in and out. And you need to recognize that God is at work in your church. And that's very exciting. It's weird. Sometimes, you know, God says, mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. And sometimes you got to do them at both at the same time and it feels really strange. He said, I will do these things and you will become great. So that God gets the glory and people are reached with the gospel and Compton is changed and taken to new levels and the hope in Christ church remains to have the spirit of God doing the work of God through the people of God who he chooses will lead. And we need to honor your pastor for his faith and follow his example by being encouraged to take the challenge of change as a step towards greatness. Let's pray. God, you offer great blessing and great things to happen. But you do that for those who step out of their comfort zones so that you are doing it, so that you get the glory, so that you provide the energy and the strength and the wisdom and the power and the might for your glory. Yes. And God, you tend to use leaders to set that example. And so God, we thank you for this place. Thank you for this lampstand. Thank you for the light that he holds. And I pray that this church would come alongside of him and support him in his decision to follow you. And God, maybe you're calling some of the people here from something to something. Maybe we need to make some adjustments, some recognitions. God, would you do a great work in this neighborhood and in this building as it reaches out. Thank you for their partnership in the gospel with the Union Rescue Mission. Thank you for Pastor Ed and his faithfulness to serve here these past nine years and willingness, even though he has somewhere that, that you want to lead him, that, that he's putting it on hold for a year so the church can prepare. And God, I pray that you'd bless this next year to be something really fabulous. Great. Give great blessing to Ed and his family and his wife who, who uh, is in this journey with him. God, pray that she might uh, trust her husband's leadership, believe in his walk with you, and re recognize that she's a partner in this walk, that what they're doing, they do together. May she be encouraged, give victory over fear or anxiety that the church might have in this change. And God, may we anticipate the greatness of the next steps of this church. May this be a tremendous year and following. And God, if we as individuals are stuck in our comfort zones, would you minister to that? We give you the right to, to disrupt us. And if we're having trouble, God, help us even to pray the prayer. God, I don't think I can even say that right now, and that's honest. 
but God, would you bring me to a place where I'd be willing for you to disrupt my comfort zone? Because God, I want to be great for your name's sake. God, help us not to settle, but to walk this journey towards greatness through the challenge of change. In Jesus' name, amen.